Merry Christmas and welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Gremlins, the classic 1984 horror movie. It certainly is not a horror film. Oh, I mean the classic 1984 Christmas movie. No, I can't bring it out of Christmas. It's not a Christmas movie. Just bring it out of Christmas and it's a Christmas movie. Right, okay, the classic 1984 uh, movie. Gremlins was the second screenplay written by Chris Columbus, who would go on to write and then direct many movies of your childhood. Seriously, the guy's filmography is impressive. The script was found by Steven Spielberg, who was looking for movies to produce under Amblin Entertainment, the company he had recently formed with friends and fellow producers Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy. Yes, that Kathleen Kennedy. Her career was long and successful before she became head of Lucasfilm. Spiel Spielberg chose Joe Dante to direct, believing he could strike the right tone based on his previous films, Piranha and The Howling. Dante loves making movies with fantastical elements. My favorite kind of movies are the ones that show you things that you really can't see anywhere but in the movies. Between Columbus's script, Dante's direction, and Spielberg's guidance as executive producer, Gremlins wound up being a film without a genre. At once a gooey gateway into creature feature horror, and the heartwarming tale of a boy and his dog thing, who births a bunch of destructive monsters. I love love the result, a movie that isn't tailored towards any specific demographic. Gremlins is happy being its own thing, and audiences were happy with it too. It was the fourth highest grossing film of the year and a pop cultural phenomenon of the 80s. And despite what Mr. Dante might have said, I think it makes for a damn fine Christmas movie. How many kills do you wind up with? What? What the hell? What happened to the video? <gasps> Gremlins! Ah! Ah! Oh. Hey, little guy. Hello. Hey, sorry to crash the party, but I've got a kill count to film, so... Hey, you knocked down today's sponsor! Displate! Huh? You know, Displate. Like, uh, Displate. Oh my god. They're high-quality metal prints that you mount on your walls with magnets. So, don't worry about knocking it down, man. Putting it back up is a breeze. Although, come to think about it, I have been meaning to swap this out for a spare. So, thanks for the reminder, little guy. <laughs> See, thanks to the magnet mounting system, it is easy as hell to swap them out. And with 1.4 million awesome designs available, you can really customize it for any move. Okay, okay, I see you're not completely sold. But what if I told you that for every disc plate you purchase, they'll plant a tree? I mean, even you have to breathe, right? Ha! Thought that would get you. All right, how about we make a deal? I'll buy you some disc plates, and you can let me finish this kill count, okay? Business. <laughs> All right, thanks, little buddy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll work on that next. You can go to displate.com slash deadmeat to check out some of my favorite disc plates, grab your own, and get a special discount. Again, that's displate.com slash deadmeat to see my picks and get a discount. How many kills do you wind up with when you don't take proper care of your pet? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with amateur inventor Rand Peltzer singing R.E.M. That's me there on the corner. That's him at the stoplight, hawking his contraptions. He's led into Mr. Wing's underground pipe emporium, where he tries to sell the bathroom buddy, an all-in-one splugeon cube. His Chinatown visit becomes less Nicholson, more Saint Nick, when he decides he wants to buy a gift for his son, so he checks out the blue light special on this crying creature in the corner. We don't see the critter, but we learn what it's called. Mogwai! Singing. He does that sometimes. But they're mostly instrumental. Rand says he needs to have this creature for his son, but Mr. Wing shoots him down. Mogwai, not for sale. That's what they tell the record labels, too. Rand ups his offer to a few hundos, but Wing ain't selling to nobody but Spider-Man. With Mogwai comes much responsibility. Screenwriter Chris Columbus named the creature's Mogwai, the Cantonese word for devil or demon, because of his fascination with stores like Mr. Wing's in New York's Chinatown. Fortunately for Rand, Mr. Wing's proto short round grandson vastly undervalues a brand new species. He meets Rand in the McGalley to close the sale and earn his coffee. He warns him there are three rules for Mogwai. No bright lights, don't get them wet, and most importantly, never, never feed them after midnight. And yes, yes, we all know the ambiguity of that last one. When does after midnight end? 
What about time zones or daylight savings time? I can't make any jokes about it that haven't already been made. In any case, at least Rand takes the rules super seriously. Sure, kid, whatever you say. Ha, <laughs> he just wants to kick back and remember the reason for the season. Title card! The Americana opening credits go full Norman Rockwell as we're treated to snowball fights and, um, sentient Christmas trees. What the hell is this? It's Treevenge! If the town of Kingston Falls looks timeless, it's because it was filmed at Universal Studios on the same Clock Tower Square set famously used in Back to the Future. It has an air of obvious artifice to it, but that was fine with director Joe Dante. We wanted to stylize it to the point where it was obviously a backlot town, and it was obviously a place that's idealized, and it's not something that you have to completely believe in. It's a state of mind. That's also why they didn't bother trying to make fake visible breath. The movie was shot in the middle of summer, with faux snow made through various methods, including white gypsum sand, limestone, and ground up ice. Billy Peltzer's car be looking like a powdered donut, thanks to all that spray on snow, so he hoofs it to his job at the local bank, which is honestly a pretty sweet gig. Every day is bring your good boy to work day. Unfortunately, his mellow is about to be harshed by a woman looking to collect the bounty on a mutant killer snowman. It's the very Scrooge-like Mrs. Deagle. Mrs. Harris, the bank and I have the same purpose in life, to make money. Business! Deagle wants the dog dead for decapitating her decoration, and Billy, why he can kiss her grits. Her mood sours further when Barney brings the house down on her wicked witch ass. Oh man, if that dog wasn't getting put down before, he sure as hell is now. Billy draws out his anger with animator Chuck Jones in a cameo. You're doing fine. Thanks. It works as a nod to Looney Tunes' early depictions of gremlins. A constant menace to pilots of the gremlins. The idea of gremlins first came about in the 1920s as an explanation for mechanical failures in early aircraft. It inspired Raoul Dahl, a World War II RAF pilot, to publish a children's book called The Gremlins in 1943. It's how Columbus landed on the name. His dad would blame gremlins for their car troubles. He would always talk about the gremlins in the car that were causing it not to work. There was recently an action horror movie about these gremlins called Shadow in the Cloud, starring Chloe Grace Moretz. I thought it was pretty cool. Billy's co-worker Gerald Hopkins berates him for being poor, since money's all that matters to him. Well, money and hitting on the movie's love interest. Hey, Kate, you haven't seen my new apartment. I haven't seen your old apartment. Kate Barringer's not interested in Gerald. Maybe because they've done this before. Judge Reinhold had already bothered Phoebe Cates in Fast Times at Ridgemont High two years earlier. Maybe he can find his- oh, never mind. That's it. He's out of the movie. Originally, Gerald was supposed to be the third lead alongside Billy and Kate, but Dante decided three was a crowd. Glad he did. The deleted scenes with him are kind of weird. Back home, Billy and his mom Lynn suffer through Papa Peltzer's faulty inventions. I love a good bad inventor dad archetype. You got your Wayne Zielinski, your Stu Pickleses, your crazy old Maurices. It's always great. Rand's inventions were created by production designer James Spencer, who also made the sets, like Chinatown, which was filmed on the Warner Brothers lot in Burbank. Rand comes home bearing a present, a widow baby jump scare in a box. <laughs> oh, look at the little guy. He's too cute to function. And Rand's already given him a name. I just call him Gizmo. He seems to like it. Gizmo was an animatronic made by special effects artist Chris Wayless, who knew the job would be a huge challenge. This picture is by far the most ambitious thing I've ever worked on. The design originated with sketches by Columbus, with coloring input from executive producer Steven Spielberg. He asked for the Mogwai to have the same colors as his pet King Charles Spaniel dogs. It fell on the actors to treat Gizmo like a real animal, even though they could see the massive cable system coming out of him. It was even worse for Billy's actor, Zach Galligan, since the cables were often routed through his clothes. While Gizmo's face could be swapped around, depending on if he needed to be smiley, frowny, or otherwise, his body movement were controlled by a variety of hand controls and joysticks. Of course, you can only fit so many motors inside a small gizmo body. For more expressive close-ups, they created an oversized animatronic that was big enough to house the extra motors they needed. In some cases, they had to create oversized props to use with it, like a big old pair of 3D glasses. I know we learned about a lot of this animatronic stuff in the Chucky recounts, but like I said there, I never get sick of seeing behind-the-scenes videos and pictures. Finally, Gizmo's voice was provided by comedian and Howie Mandel. Actually, this is my real voice. I do this so people don't make fun of me. Mandel came on after the movie was filmed and mostly edited, so he describes himself as a condiment on this already tasty film. You want your hamburger, but you go, it just needs mustard. 
this is the mustard. It all added up to a lovable character who's been imitated many times over, which is not always taken as flattery by the filmmakers. An eager camera flash from Lynn makes Gizmo do a silly one, so Rand informs his family of the three simple rules for dating his teenage mogwai. For his part, Billy seems pretty chill about his new pet having commandments. He plays some tones for his pet alien before giving it a close encounter with a light. Kind of off to a crappy start, but hey, at least he can show Gizmo off to his friends, like Pete, who, wait, what the fuck? That's a child. Uh, what's this whole situation, Bill? Pete's actually the child of 80s horror, of course, since he's played by Corey Feldman, the same year he'd tell Jason to die, die, die. Pete didn't read the Mogwai rulebook, so he breaks rule two and gets Gizmo wet. Good job, TJ. You spilled dirty paint water on a possible alien life form. Within seconds, they're watching the miracle of childbirth, as Gizmo sires a full offensive line of hairballs. They're even worse than Lucy's. They look much more evil, with a white little mohawk on the biggest one. What I love about Billy is how much he trusts his parents, since he immediately goes to tell his dad. Rand doesn't see a furry infestation, though. He sees an exciting new licensing opportunity. They might even replace the dog as the family pet. Aw, oh, Rand, don't do Barney like that. You're a happy family. The hapless Peltzer patriarch, who's always working his fingers to the bone, is played by Hoyt Axton, a folk musician turned character actor. He wrote and recorded Joy to the World, which you probably know better from the Christmas-tinged cover by Three Dog Night. I love Axton's voice and natural performance, as did Dante, who let him reword his lines to his own liking. I want you to be happy, Joe, okay? There's no reason I'm doing the picture. I don't want the money. I don't care about the fame. You want the money? Oh, great. No, because it just don't happen. <laughs> Stumped by Mogwai sex, Billy asks his chem teacher Mr. Hansen to traumatize his pet again. I keep one of these here and run some tests on him. Hansen can't keep his hands off and commits animal rights violations in his free period. Billy leaves school and runs into all-American townie Mr. Futterman. You know this mother Futterman, it's Dick Damn Miller, an unforgettable character actor who Joe Dante used in, like, seriously, pretty much all of his films. Miller's also appeared in countless horror movies, including Roger Corman's Bucket of Blood and, of course, Chopping Mall, where he delivered a line that's become very important to this channel. Go ahead and laugh, you guys. But if I ever find a little bastard that did this, they're dead meat. His character in Gremlins is, uh, pretty racist. You gotta watch out for no foreigners because they plant gremlins in their machinery. Though Dante's style clearly evokes nostalgia for mid-century Americana, he never masks over its blemishes either, like an obsession with turning profit or nasty strains of nationalism. Billy gives back Futterman's know-nothing flyer and walks home with Kate, who teaches him the true meaning of Christmas. That's when a lot of people get really depressed. She's not a fan of the holiday, but is a fan of Billy asking her out on a date. Zach Galligan and Phoebe Kate are both great at inhabiting these characters. Him, innocent and crushing hard. Her, depressed but interested. Producer Michael Finnell says they were clear choices during auditions. When Zach put his head on Phoebe's shoulder, it was something between the takes. They weren't reading the scene. We actually thought, oh look, the, the, he's already in love with her. Zach Galligan's actually been on the kill count once before, as a blink and you miss it victim in the Hellraiser 3 nightclub massacre. Back in Billy's penthouse, Gizmo watches the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Dante worked with its star, Kevin McCarthy, on Piranha, The Howling, and Twilight Zone the movie. Dante is a genre fan through and freaking through, thus all the Easter eggs and cameos in this film, like William Schallert from The Incredible Shrinking Man, Kenneth Toby from The Thing from Another World, and The Time Machine from from, um, uh, uh, well, the time machine. Other cameos include Harry Carey Jr. and Scott Brady, but I can't say I really know those guys, and I'm not gonna insult you by pretending. Gizmo's well-behaved enough for TV time, but this rowdy Moshkwai pit has got the munchies. After double-checking that it's still a PM hour, Billy gives them an entire plate of chicken wings, but turns out the little rascals voided the warranty on his clock, meaning he just broke the third commandment, thou shall not feed after midnight. His room gets a xenomorph Yas Queen makeover. He finds a similar Similarly eggy situation with Mr. Hansen's specimen at the school. Later, Hansen hears some rumbling from the creature during a screening of an educational film. It's Hemo the Magnificent, directed by legendary old Hollywood filmmaker Frank Capra. Capra also made the slightly more famous It's a Wonderful Life, which gets its own cameo, as well as a direct visual reference early on when Billy is running through the streets of Kingston Falls. Mr. Hansen thinks the hobgoblin isn't itself when it's hungry, so he feeds it a candy bar. It doesn't go over well. <laughs> Billy reaches a science teacher too late to help. The gremlin has acquired its first victim for the kill count. Yo, was Mr. Hansen juicing? I always thought that guy was natty. Billy T tries to phone home, but the gremlin does not accept the charges. It gets in one more jump scare attack. Oh, yeah. 
before running away through the school's ventilation system. Back at the Peltzer house of the future! Torture! The dartboard idea came from the crew, who had good reason to fantasize about Gizmo's violent death. Everybody hated Gizmo, <laughs> because he was smaller than the other puppets, and he had lots and lots of gears and things and many things to go wrong, and so he would break down all the time. Yeah, Gizmo was fragile as hell, since there were so many complicated animatronics and such a tiny body. When Gizmo broke, you could hear it. <laughs> like, he would turn and you'd hear like, pa ping and like a spring would pop in his ear. The delays were frequent and lengthy. One time, it took so long to fix him, the crew literally fell asleep on set. I turned to Hoyt one time and I was like, what do you think, six hours? He's like, I think more like eight hours. And they'd be like, ah, eh, that's about a seven hour delay, and we're like, ah. Oh. He tied. Unfortunately for the Peltzer clan, Pop was out of town, trying to sell his inventions at a gosh dang sight gag convention. Oh look, Steven Spielberg, riding around since his leg was in a cast at the time. There's also another guy who's supposed to be dressed like Joe Dante in his directing outfit. <laughs> Even I didn't get it. With Rand experiencing sweet misery, first stuck at the convention, and then later in a blizzard with Popeye the Cigarette Man, Mrs. Peltzer's alone in their house, and cut off when the gremlins continue their telephobia. Lynn arms herself with a knife before finding the monsters munching the heads off her cookies, a possible reference to the character's original fate. Columbus's original script was way more horror and R-rated. The gremlins ate an entire McDonald's worth of people, Barney the dog was also eaten, instead of just getting strung up in Christmas lights, and Lynn the mom was straight up decapitated. It was really tough, a tough stuff. Uh, Billy's mother's head was cut off and it rolled down the stairs. I'm glad she doesn't die, because Lynn kicks major ass. She starts by getting one gremlin into a Peltzer brand mixing bowl. That'll get him added to our separate gremlin kill count. That's right, I'm doing what I shall dub the Zoran Tremors protocol and counting gremlin kills, but keeping them separate from humanoids. Another gremlin makes sure the dishes are done, man. It attacks with fine china in its hands and a steel rod in its arm. Lynn counters with an old-fashioned stabbing. And by old-fashioned, I mean excessive. Damn, Lynn. She continues the Great British beatdown after the last Paul Holly hoodlum tosses her cookies. Lynn sprays him with CDCs and puts him in the oh-no zone. She then brings an urban legend to life with great green globs of greasy, grimy gremlin guts. Wow, that is graphic. Gremlins was rated PG by the MPAA because back then, the only ratings they gave were X, R, P, G, and G. Complaints were made about the violence in Gremlins, as well as in the similarly PG-rated Temple of Doom. So Spielberg suggested they created a PG-13 rating. Two months after Gremlins' release, it was born. Mrs. P grabs a second knife to dual wield, then claims the life of an innocent breakdancing robot and turns walnuts into floor nuts. Yeah, maybe you should be working on this sentient pine tree epidemic, Lynn. Billy runs in to find her trimming the tree the hard way. Quick, Billy. The sword! That's right! No one messes with the Knights of Columbus! There's nothing better than a gremlin skull roasting on an open fire. Really warms the frontal lobe. The only surviving gremlin is the big mohawk leader Stripe. He makes his feelings and sinus infection known before Sally Hardesting out the window. In earlier drafts, Gizmo turned into Stripe, but Spielberg liked Gizmo too much and suggested he stay a good guy. The upside was, this probably made for a better movie. That really turned the movie around and made the film sort of much more accessible to an audience and much more emotional. The downside was, they had to deal with the faulty gizmo animatronic the entire film instead of just the first act. It was much easier dealing with the gremlins, who were often simple puppets. That's why they have longer arms, so they can be controlled with rods. You see the same thing in Chucky's design in the TV show. His arms are a little longer, since the faster TV schedule required more use of rod puppetry. Early on in Gremlins production, they tried to use a rhesus monkey in a gremlin mask. They bailed on that idea when the monkey kept pooping everywhere. Despite their different behavior, Chris Wayless had to make it clear the Mogwai and Gremlins were related. They had to in many ways be opposites, cute and cuddly and scaly and nasty, but still had to be two sides of the same character. The giant ears of both creatures, partly inspired by Tarsiers, provided that biological link. They also helped make the puppets look more animated and convey emotion since their faces were mostly static. Billy drops his mom off at the doctor's and out of the film, which always makes me sad. She's such a cool character. At least she stays alive long enough to look over Sidney Prescott 12 years later. Billy starts to track the hairy head honcho and wait, I gotta talk this out. When is a gremlin actually 
actually wet. Clearly, Stripe walked through the snow, but apparently that wasn't enough. Barney went in for a taste earlier, and Maguire are always spitting at each other, so I guess saliva doesn't count either? They addressed the time zone thing in the sequel, but what about the wetness, Joe? What about the wetness? Anyway, Billy tracks Stripe to the local Y, evidently designed by F.W. Murnau. Gremlin, there's a place you can go, I said Gremlin. When you wanna make mo, you can swim there. And I'm sure you will hatch many back egg sacks in no time. This is what we all came to see, folks. A whole ass army of destructive little guys. <laughs> Look at them go. They marched through the street of a miniature town in stop motion, which was used out of preference and practicality. We have stop motion in the movie because I love stop motion, and there were certain things that we just weren't gonna be able to do any other way. Specifically, he's talking about making the gremlins walk. They tried, but the technology didn't exist yet, which is why you never see them lifting their legs and taking steps. It was easy to solve this problem for Gizmo, though. They just stuck him in a backpack most of the time. The next targets for the gremlins are Murray Futterman and his wife Sheila. She's played by Jackie Joseph, the first person to play Audrey in the original Little Shop of Horrors. That movie also featured Dick Miller and was made by Roger Corman, Joe Dante's filmmaking mentor. Murray loses his battle with the Red Skeleton Hour and puts on his Bane coat to check the damage. What the hell is that? <laughs> Why, that's the Gremlin Rag! The now iconic Gremlins theme was composed by Jerry Goldsmith, who won a Saturn Award for his Gremlins score and appears in this movie at the Cameo Convention. Goldsmith was a prolific composer, whose work in horror included Alien, Poltergeist, and the Brendan Fraser Mummy. Dante wasn't sure at first about the demented, mischievous merry-go-round music, but in the end, realized what was obvious. This is the perfect sound for these evil but lovable little bastards. I mean, look at how much fun they're having in there. They give the Futterman's a new bay window, but despite what it looks like, do not kill them. They both show up in the crazy-ass sequel. The Gremlin gang creates chaos around town, causing traffic accidents and committing mail fraud. When that's not enough, they're willing to do a full-on murder. But first, Mrs. Deagle, let me carol at ya. Wow, these little guys pick up human culture fast. She flees them, but they've somehow set her stair lift to Mach 1. She does not have a Holly Polly holiday as she goes up the world's longest staircase and straight to the moon, Alice. That's one small step for Mogwai, one giant leap for old bad kind. The police see this happen, and when faced with the prospect of evil gremlins, cut loose and break bad. Yeah, Frank, I really think we should go now. It's kind of funny, Frank. Do I should start the car? Because I'd really like to go back to the station now. Yes, that's Jonathan Banks, freaking Mike from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. You'll need to get cleaning this Santa Claus after the gremlins kill him while the cops do absolutely nothing. That'll get him on the naughty list for show. I won't count kills from any of the rest of the chaos going on. Not even when the cops flip their car upside down. These car stunts are cool, but they don't look lethal. Billy and Gizmo head to a local bar named Dory's, which is where Gremlins ascends to a higher plane of art. Even if it was hell for Dante to work with all these Gremlin puppets. I don't talk about the puppets. There were over a hundred puppets, each with different capabilities and limitations. With them, I mean, they shot the whole joke book, y'all. We've got drunk Gremlins, gamer Gremlins, pervert Gremlins, dated movie reference Gremlins, timeless movie reference Gremlins, Liver failure gremlins, firefighter gremlins, Batman parent killing gremlins, and even a gremlin who gets shot by Stripe, getting itself added to the separate gremlin kill count. This embarrassment of rubber riches was filmed after principal photography with the actors was done, during a two and a half month shoot of nothing but gremlin puppets. By the end of it, Dante forgot what he was looking at. It was maddening. It was just maddening, because after you've been staring at these puppets for all this time, you just can't tell whether they're looking real or they're not looking real. The bar scene alone took a week to shoot, probably because Dante posted a list of gags on the wall that anyone could add to if they had a funny idea. The only main cast member involved in this part of production was Phoebe Cates, since Kate is somehow stuck serving these custom monsters. She gets tired of these shit balls not tipping and figures out the rule about bright lights. It takes her a minute, but she gets her Oprah shot, and sends a gremlin swinging from a fan head first into a light up bar sign. She escapes the bar and meets back up with Billy, and together they retreat to the bank. There, Kate delivers the most amazing monologue I've ever heard in a so-called kids movie. Phoebe Cates kills it as Kate explains why she hates Christmas. The worst thing that ever happened to me 
Christmas. On Christmas. One year, her dad dressed as Santa and tried to surprise her family by coming down the chimney. Instead, he broke his neck and his body wasn't found until days later. It's heavy as hell, man, and ends with an all-timer punchline. And that's how I found out there was no Santa Claus. Both the studio and Spielberg wanted to lose this pitch black comedic moment, but Dante dug his heels in. He and Columbus thought it made the movie twisted and unique. On the face of it, it's ridiculous, and so the audience doesn't really know whether to laugh or to cry. And that was exactly what I was looking for, and in fact it encapsulates to me the whole tone of the movie Gremlins. Billy, Kate, and Giz realize the knee-high mischiefs have snuck away to the movie theater. They're watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and have taken such a liking to it, they already know the words. <coughs> well, two of them at least. Billy decides he has to do something and sneaks inside the theater, just as Stripe decides to sneak out for some snacks. Yum, yum. Stripe and most of the Gremlins were voiced by Frank Welker, a prolific voice actor maybe best known as Fred and Scooby from Scooby-Doo. His voice was was previously on this show as Shao Kahn at the end of the OG MK. You weak, pathetic fools. In no time flat, Billy turns this entire theater into a bomb. Man, what was Mr. Hansen teaching those kids? I guess how to get a high score on the kill count. <laughs> Now, even in 4K, it is hard to count every gremlin, especially back there in the cheap seats. But I pay Josh for many reasons, and in addition to editing, he's done me the favor of counting 150 gremlins in the movie theater who meet their final destination when it blows up. That includes all the little fuckers in the theater, plus six in the projection booth, counting that shadow, and three on the reels. Rest in flames, gremlins. We hardly knew most of you, but you were probably little bastards. Oh, except that guy. Go blue! Before the lovebirds can catch their breath, they realized they didn't exterminate the species. Stripe has survived, and even worse, he's been radicalized! Billy takes some sugar, baby, and swings away to the final showdown as Kate and Gizmo post up in the security room. Stripe's first plan is to try streaming Billy to death. Hey guys, please like, subscribe, and pour water on me. Uh, thank you! After hiding in the Easter egg section, Gizmo's bastard gets his claws dirtier. He hurls saw blades and continues the saw theme by riding away on a red tricycle. That lures Billy into a trap where he's shot by a baseball machine, like you were training to be a hockey player. There's a lot going on in this sequence, and every shot took a small army of technicians to pull off. Believe it or not, the leather stripe moment, where the gremlins pulled away by a chainsaw, was thought up by Zach Galligan on set mid-shoot. And I said, oh look, you got the Texas Chainsaw Massacre homage there. And he goes, yep, there you go. And I said, wouldn't it be cool to have a baseball bat chainsaw fight? That would be awesome, wouldn't it? And he goes, that would be awesome. Billy's doing less awesome though, so Gizmo tags in. By God, it's a Mogwai in a Barbie dream car. Gizmo speeds towards Stripe, who's going forth to multiply. Club, club. Better get there fast, Giz. Just try not to scare the dog, okay? Shit, what did I just say? Poor Barney, or rather poor Mushroom, the actor dog. The dog in the movie was convinced that this creature was alive. Aw, that makes it even cuter when he licks Gizmo's ear. Also makes me think Frances Lee McCain wasn't acting when she had to hold back Mushroom in this shot. What is it? No. It's your new pet. Come on, Barney, be a good dog. And of course, one time Mushroom bit the animatronic, which broke it and caused a delay. While Gizmo feeds his need for speed, Stripe's drinking at the Fountain of Life to spawn more evil offspring. Before he can finish mutating into a Ninja Turtle, Gizmo scores some style points by launching off a shovel ramp. <laughs> Whoa, what the hell kind of batteries were in that thing? The plan still works, cause Gizmo wins this multiverses battle by yanking the blinds open. Wow, he hit that ceiling hard! Sorry buddy. Proving sunlight's the best disinfectant, Stripe starts dissolving into street trash. Oh hey, welcome back Rand! Bet you sure was glad when you saw the dawn! Somebody turned on the light, and it caused Stripe to melt down to Frank Cotton status. It's a wonderful Christmas gift slash Christmas trauma for the Peltzers to witness. Now Billy and Kate truly are perfect for each other. The family gathers around the the tree to reminisce about destroying an entire species, but Mr. Wing shows up and spoils the fun with some harsh words for Western civilization. You do with Mokwai what your society has done with all of nature's gifts. Wing demands to take Gizmo home with him, though Billy still gets a farewell. Bye, Bye Gizmo! See you in the sequel, little guy. The movie ends with more world-weary narration from Rand Peltzer. He says if dead meat videos have been playing slow lately, try poking around your router. There just might be a gremlin in your house. But how dangerous is that gremlin to you and your woof woof? Let's find out and get to the numbers.
Oh, Jesus, the numbers. The worst thing that ever happened to me happened at the numbers. Oh, God, it was so horrible. It was September 2022. I was 33 years old. I was going through the kill count schedule for the month, and I saw that we had an opening. I figured, hey, why not let Zorn fill it? You know, as, as like a wedding gift. <laughs> he was so happy. A week went by and then I got the script. It was funny. You know, in like that Zorin kind of way. But I stopped laughing when I saw the kills. I refreshed the Google Doc, just, just hoping that it was some kind of mistake, but... There it was. 4,000 kills from some stupid, mostly off-screen prank. And that's how I learned that the Kill Count Championship would be lost forever to fucking Dude Bro Party Massacre 3. We counted three human kills in Gremlins, consisting of two human dudes and one human lady. Not a very interesting human kill count, which is why we also counted 157 Gremlin kills. Altogether, that makes 160 victims. And funny enough, Gremlins were only responsible for four of them. Lynn Peltzer had three kills, Kate had one, Billy bagged 151, and the final kill was because of Gizmo. With a runtime of 106 minutes, that gave us a human kill on average every 35 and a third minutes. Gremlin kills, on the other hand, averaged once every 40 and a half seconds. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to the monster, the myth, the mohawk, Stripe. Motherfucker had a truly Hellraiser-esque skelebelt, looking like Frosty the Snowman left out in the sun. It's gooey, it's gross, it's golden, baby. Dol Machete for lamest kill goes to Santa Claus. Mainly because, I mean, did they eat him? I'm not sure what gremlins do. And they had all winter to figure this out. And we've got to reward this pop culture titan with its own award. The gold medal for greatest gremlin. My personal favorite and inaugural winner of this award is Bogart Gremlin. In homage to legendary actor Humphrey Bogart, this gremlin just seems to be done with it all. You really feel for him, surrounded by the juvenile antics of these lesser gremlins. Oh, and for anyone about to leave a comment, Stripe wasn't eligible for this award. He'd be too easy a winner. Stripe rules. And that's it. Gremlins came out in 1984. Warner Brothers wasn't sure what to make of it, but Spielberg vouched for Joe Dante's vision. It paid off, and Dante is still grateful to this day. Every scene that comes up is sort of like, wow, we got away with that. Six years later, he'd make a sequel that is somehow even more unhinged. I'll show you next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching The Gremlins Kill Count, which, yes, is this year's Christmas special. One day I'll get to Anna and the Apocalypse, although a bunch of Christmas horror movies came out this year. Next year, December might be full. Huge thanks to our new assistant, Fiona, who decorated this set. I've come in here multiple times over the past few days and just kind of stood and admired it. I love the fucking chaos of it all. Also, I'm, I'm dressed like Rand Peltzer. Did it play? Did you get that? Do you understand? I couldn't find my Gremlin shirt. I want to thank some patrons like Type 3 Screamer, Brond Kroll, Chase Deneen, Ghoul J, Stephen Raleigh, Phoenix, Kevin Beto, and Daryl Abney. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.